Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, Hour 1 on Wednesdays. We have Harley Schlanger and the LaRouche Foundation. I guess it's a birthday, 90th birthday coming up from Lyndon LaRouche uh, on September 8th, three days before 9-11. He'll be 90 years of age. And there's a lot of repository of wisdom there. He's acted as an international statesman for many years, uh, trying to broker a peace during the Cold War. Actually jailed for some of his attempts because of a cop between the power brokers that disagreed at the top. Uh, has been working for years diligently to tell people and warn them that the current policies of the Obama administration are marching us very swiftly toward, rather than neutralizing the weapons of Syria and Iran, which needs to be done, rather than neutralizing the weapons of Hezbollah and making sure the Israelis don't do as a preemptive strike. We have the latest stories. In fact, one of the interesting ones that I dug up when I was doing my research is the fact that uh, the U.S. military doesn't back what uh, is going on. It's quite quite remarkable. The U.S. military are not backing the move by uh, Obama to do a preemptive strike. And uh, this latest movie that was put forward by the LaRouche Foundation, I think, is pretty apropos. It's called uh, The uh, Unsurvivable. And we're going to have the links up for that. Let's talk about this today. What, what we're marching toward isn't survivable, is it? Well, let me start with the first thing you said, which is that uh, it will be Mr. LaRouche's 90th birthday. And just as a, an indication of, of how things work in the real world, there's a Russian publication called Zavtra, which is a leading publication of the, what you might call the academic and intellectuals in Russia, who are part of the nationalist forces associated with the Academy of Sciences and Putin. And they had a page one article today praising Mr. LaRouche for his work, uh, as you mentioned, with the SDI, that Mr. LaRouche, despite being rejected by uh, the American voters in his 1980 presidential campaign, was brought in by Ronald Reagan, drafted the policy which became known as the SDI, and has continued to work for it. The idea that the solution to the danger of nuclear war is not endless negotiations around disarmament while there's still distrust all around, but actually moving into a whole new era of peaceful cooperation in space uh, with uh, uh, collaboration against terrorism, drug trafficking, and so on. And so uh, I I do want to join you in in, uh, calling on your listeners to wish Mr. LaRouche a happy birthday. What Zavtra said is he's 90 years old and still going strong, and I think we should all be grateful for that. Now, what he just did this last week was he organized the production of a video called Unsurvivable, which is designed to shock people. Now, you and I, who are children of the Cold War, grew up under the the threat of nuclear annihilation, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Duck duck and cover. We, yeah, we, yeah we, were, we were raised in the 50s and 60s during the duck and cover days. Where they say that you, you crouch over, put your head between your knees, and then kiss your ass goodbye. That was <laughs> exactly, the, yeah. That was Final the, goodbye, see ya. Yeah. Now, yeah, nice knowing you. <laughs> now, many people from our generation assumed that the end of the Cold War meant no more nuclear war threat. But these missiles <laughs> and weapons still exist. And the problem is that there's no legitimate cause for war, but we have illegitimate causes, in particular based on the collapse of the financial system, because unfortunately the people who control the British Isles, the United States, and the European continent are tied to a financial elite which has been based on speculation, free trade, deregulation, which has collapsed the world's financial system, and they don't intend to see a change in policy. They would rather go to war. So Mr. LaRouche had some of the young people in our Percival, Virginia headquarters put together a stark and dark video which discusses the unthinkable. What happens if Obama does launch a war? Now, you mentioned the second point here, which is extremely important. This last week, General Martin Dempsey the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff gave press conferences in London and in Dublin. And in both cases, he contradicted the policy of the United States. He said, we must not get involved in Syria because there's no way out. 
and that there's no reason for a strike on Iran by Israel, and that the United States would not support Israel if they did it. Dempsey said, I do not wish to be complicit if such a strike occurs. Now, this was covered in the Daily Independent of London under the headline, Obama wrong on Syria, top general says. And that's how, you know, Americans who heard Mitt Romney's speech, where he said Obama's not tough enough on Syria and Iran and he's too soft on Russia, they ought to realize that the military, the people who fight wars in this country, are saying, don't go to war, look for a way to resolve these things. And the Russians are working with the Americans on this. And here's right. one other story that came out in Israel today, which is really fascinating. It said that the military, the U.S. military, told the Israeli military that we do not have their backs. And not yeah, only that... That's amazing, isn't it? That, that actually came out in the regular media. Yeah. Through, through channels, back channels, the Iranians were told that if Israel strikes them, the United States will not back Israel provided Iran does not hit U.S. facilities and ships in the Persian Gulf. And the, the administration came out and denied that. Jade Carney, the press spokesman for the biggest liar on the planet, Barack Obama, right. came out and said that story is untrue. And well, that came out from the military. That came out from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That story was actually the truth, that we have a disagreement between the so-called usurper-in-chief and the Joint Chiefs of Staff that are trying to be drawn into a third world war status. This will make the Bay of Pigs look like a party. And the, the, the point of this movie, Unsurvivable, which is 31 minutes, and I, you know, go to the LaRouchePack.com website and watch it. And stick with it, because it's dark and gloomy and a little frightening. But I think there are times like this where people need to be frightened with yeah, images I, of, their, of eyeballs melting in the sockets, of right. skin falling off like chunks of, of, of uh, clothing. Now, people have to have these images to realize that we have a man in the White House who is so crazy he will do anything to get reelected and will do anything that he's told. And one example of this is that now, editorially, most of the major press in this country, seven governors, any number of senators, have called on Obama to drop this mandate that 10% of our gasoline has to be made from ethanol because we have a major food shortage because of the drought, corn right. especially. They're saying there will be food shortages by the winter. Right. Obama says, no, we're not going to interfere with the ethanol. Now, right, why because is that? He's yeah. trying, he knows the prices will go much higher for gasoline if ethanol is taken off the market. He'd rather have food shortages and starvation this winter well, than you're... increase in prices in gasoline now for his election campaign. Well, That's the major source of... Right, the major source of food for our animals is going to be uh, alternatively the source for gasohol. And so what will happen is you're going to see the price of meat go through the ceiling, the price of other commodities because of crop failures is going to go through the ceiling, and Obama doesn't care because he's got a green agenda. He sh he's also talking about unilaterally shutting down our nuclear forces without proper agreement. He sh he's not really discussing what they're planning on doing in terms of our uh, missile defense systems in Eastern Europe. It should be collaborative with these other countries. The idea is the only reason why a, a missile defense actually prevents a nuclear war is if all the nations are parties to it. The it's idea that, that one nation can have Ronald it... Ronald Reagan understood that. One of the Army problems is... So called conservatives, Dr. Deagle, running around saying they want to be the next Ronald Reagan, don't understand that Ronald Reagan actually understood what LaRouche is saying because right. he sent LaRouche to negotiate with the Russians for him. Right. The point is, if you have a missile defense, it's actually provocative for a first strike attack, firstly against the defenses and then against America. It increases the risk of an attack, not decrease it. Right? Yeah, exactly. Back in a moment. Welcome back. So we're going to talk about um, some more about this unsurvivable. Um, 
here's a timeline that I see happening. And I talked yesterday, we had on hour number one, David Rubin. Uh, we talked with Johnson Gray on hour three, who is our ancient archaeologist. Today we have Theodore Shubat, whose father, Walid, was a Palestinian who now is a Christian here in America. Uh, Theodore was born here in America. Uh, they're experts on the Middle East. They know what's going on. What's going on is the final steps toward Armageddon. Now, people think, no, Dr. Deagle. Every generation has thought that they're the final generation, that this is going to happen. Well, I, I'm here to tell you that this is not a joke. We're not exaggerating. That unless we change our status, unless we repent of our policies, unless we start treating other human beings with more respect, and also it doesn't mean we have to also respect the crazy policies of countries like Islam, but we need to neutralize their weapons but not kill their people and destroy their infrastructure because what we have is a situation that can get out of hand very, very quickly and is likely to end not only civilization and not only mankind but literally life on this planet. Uh, this is not a joke. This is this is really happening as we speak. And who we elect in this next election and how they interact with uh, with Russia and China and the Middle East. And I, I do mean proactively. Don't just let things happen and then apologize yourself into supporting the Israelis in whatever crazy policy they want. Because the Israeli IDF and others have actually said a preemptive strike is stupid. But we do need to neutralize their 200,000 weapons aimed at Israel, because eventually Israel will use the Samson option if they're put in a corner by the crazy Muslims. Well, but you see, this is exactly why people have to understand what Yitzhak Rabin represented and what the Oslo Accord represented. Rabin was someone who was one of the fierce fighters against the Palestinians. Right. He had served loyally as a, a top commander, and in the late eight, uh, 1980s, when there was the uh, intifada, the rebellion by the Palestinians, Rabin was the one who gave the orders, break their arms, break their legs, but do it off camera. Now, when Rabin saw what was happening, he had a change in heart. He said, not to the Palestinians, he said, we're destroying the morality of the Israelis. He said that the only justification for a Jewish state is that we will be a model for the world. And if we're acting as those who, who persecuted us, then there's no reason to having a state. And what Rabin understood was that you have to be strong, you have to be tough, but you also have to be generous. And one of the things he said, and I was at a forum uh, in uh, Seattle, Washington, when the, one of the top Israeli negotiators was there, he said... Uh, he, it was a, a free trade seminar, and he attacked free trade. He said, Rabin will never do to the Palestinians what the Americans are doing to the Mexicans with the North American Free Trade Alliance. In other words, what the Israelis were trying to do was bring in industry, bring in science. Because the, you know, there are Palestinian doctors and scientists all over the world. Why not allow them to develop their nation? And that's why Rabin was killed. And he was killed by the people today who are supporting Netanyahu and Netanyahu's insane policy of strike first and then answer the, the questions later. Now, one of the things that came out, this we were talking earlier about Martin Dempsey and the Joint Chiefs opposing Obama's Syria policy and the Israeli attack on Iran. One after another, all the retired and former leaders of the Israel Defense Forces and Security Forces and Intelligence, the Mossad, have come out and said there's no reason to strike now. There's no reason to attack. In fact, one of them uh, the other day said, uh, Gabi Ashkenazi, who is the, the last head of the IDF, Israel Defense Forces, said, why not talk to the Iranians about mutual development? We used to work with the Iranians. And so you can see that what's coming to the surface around the world are people who are serious adults, serious Christians, Jews, and Muslims. In the White House, we have someone who is a very proud narcissist. He told the New York Times he's the best, he works to be the best at everything, including cards and pool and golf. You know, he's played golf 104 times since he's president trying to improve his game. Wow. He, That's a lot of golf. And, and the thing about a narcissist is that when they can't get their way, they get even more enraged. 
And that's why Obama is talking about a no-fly zone over Syria, why he's sending out messages that the Europeans have to join the United States in recognizing a new government. Now, the people that Obama is working with, the so-called Free Syrian Army, Syrian National Council, this week put out a statement that they're going to start shooting down civilian aircraft going into Aleppo and Damascus because those aircraft are serving the regime of Assad. That means That's amazing, isn't it? We're supporting terrorists. And this, we've, you and I have talked about this before, the Al-Qaeda networks and so on. But how much more blatant could it be? That's who Obama is bringing the United States into an alliance with. Exactly. That's, a, that's remarkable, isn't it? Now, uh, do you think the Oslo Accord will bring peace or more war? Because uh, I don't think that is... A partition of the state with a giant wall is not, is not a solution either. You see, Rabin, Rabin basically said, let's agree to have peace, and let's agree to start the economic process, to start up lifting the standard of living of Palestinians, before we finalize the status of the Palestinian state, the city of Jerusalem, and these other questions. Now what happened then in 1998, after Rabin had been killed and there had been a Netanyahu government, uh, Ehud Barak came in. And Barak tried to settle everything really quickly. Ariel Sharon did his provocative march up to the Temple Mount. A new intifada started and the whole thing fell apart. I mean, look, it's what you said earlier, and I'll, I'll actually make a, a very important point here. The only basis for peace is when nations are secure enough in their own goodness and their own mission that they can recognize the interests of the other as their own. This is a very Christian doctrine that was the basis of something called the Peace of Westphalia, which was signed in 1648 to end the Thirty Years' War, which is a brutal religious war in Europe between Protestants and Catholics. Now, almost a third of the population of Germany was killed in that war. And the solution was to recognize that other people may worship differently, they may speak different languages, have a different culture, but they're human. And it's in our interest that they prosper. This was the idea that was central to Benjamin Franklin, uh, and the people who were the founders of the American Republic. And yet today, and we've, we've always had this because of the existence of the empire, the empire says there is no interest of the other, it's only our interest. The way the British put it, we have no permanent friends, only permanent interests. Yeah, that's amazingly and uh, very scary, too. It's uh, basically a policy of endless wars, endless chaos, and endless dialectics. Exactly, and, and that's why the Syrian rebels are threatening Christians in Syria. Yeah, it's a very thorny situation. Uh, back in a moment with Harley Schlanger. back and uh, yeah I think peace through strength is a proper approach uh, I do not believe that until there's a transformation of the hearts of Islam we hear the comments for example we have moderate Muslims like uh, Bashir al-Assad that basically was trained in the West he's an eye doctor he came back because his father Hafez al-Assad died uh, he has a, a wife who's westernized as well they don't want to use weapons they're not stupid we have uh, the majority of people in Iran are young people under 30, and the, and the more we harass the Iranians, the more likely we are to keep the mullahs in power. And the mullahs basically are terrified that they're not going to maintain their, their super ultra, you know, what you would call wacky religious state. But the fact is, until we have, uh, as I say, a transformation of the hearts like Jesus Christ taught, of peoples all over the world, until we actually, uh, in the meantime, we have to do what we call have peace through strength, which means you don't invade and bomb a country. You don't send air, you know, set, you know, allow and support uh, Muslim extremists that are going to say now they're going to shoot aircraft out of the air uh, coming into Aleppo and Damascus airports, civilians, civilian aircraft. But, you know, and at the same point, 
you have Obama destroying that which gives us our strength, which is our science, our machine tool capability, our advanced uh, engineering schools, and so on. You have Obama with his green agenda, which is really, green means anti-human. Right. There's a legitimate environmentalism, which is based on increasing energy flux density, increasing the burning temperature of uh, manufacturing processes, which limits the amount of, of pollutants. But if you go backwards, if you go from nuclear and go from oil and uh, uh, clean coal backwards to solar and windmill, and then what you're doing is you're essentially eliminating the basis for sustaining a population. And what Mr. LaRouche, actually his greatest innovation in terms of his teaching was his identification in the 1960s of the rock sex drug counterculture as the marchers for the post-industrial economy with a reduced population, which was exactly what Prince Philip, who founded the World Wildlife Fund, had called for, along with Prince Bernhard of the loyal Dutch shell monarchy. Prince Bernhard had been a member of the Nazi party who resigned when he married the future queen of, of the Netherlands. And he signed his resignation letter to Hitler, Heil Hitler. This was the man, Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, who with Prince Philip founded the World Wildlife Fund, not to protect animals, because have you ever seen what these guys do when they go to Africa? Oh, yeah, they're, they're brutal. every animal they can find. They're brutal, and they say, well, well I have to pay the fine. Uh, I think, who was the reason he said Juan that? Juan Carlos of Spain. Right, he said, oh, well, I have to pay a fine of $20,000, so what, you know, walking around change. And he was bragging, and I think it was about to go ahead, what, his 50th anniversary of how many whores he's had in the past number of decades. Yeah, this is, this is the mindset of the oligarchy who, unfortunately, if not Juan Carlos and Prince Philip, because they're too stupid to actually run these things. Right. But they are on the boards along with the smarter people who have been co-opted through lordships and land and countesses and these kinds of things, who run the interlocking board of directors of finance, of insurance, of pharmaceuticals, of the food cartels. You know, six grain companies control the flow of most of the world's grain. Same thing yeah. with the oil multinationals. And so the idea that somehow there's a free market out there, which is... There's no such thing as capitalism. Going, we have a, we have a, I call it a Earth Inc. corporate Earth Inc. run by banksters and global elite psychopaths and sociopaths who basically think they're a different super species. That's what we, the reality. And, and the man uh, in yeah. the 2008 election was Barack Hussein Obama. Right. Because they had vetted him and they knew that he didn't have a shred of personal morality. That right. he would do whatever he had to do. He's almost an invisible person. You can't find records on him. It's almost as though he materialized out of thin air. Well, he's a spook. He's a spooky president from a spooky family line. Uh, the man is a Sunni Muslim. He, uh, the, all his behavior, and we have experts on, like we're going to have Theodore Shabbat in hour three, uh, talking about this specifically. All the signs that indicate he's a Sunni Muslim. All his behavior, you don't have to conjecture. All the ways he's, he's actually interacted. And we have a policy that doesn't deal with the situation that, that's a danger to Israel which is a real danger, that when these bombs like the chemical RDX, uh, high explosives and, R and BX nerve gas and other things get in the hand of these uh, Muslim terrorists as they take down the Assad regime, which they're trying to do with Western help, we're likely to see an attack on Israel. And at that point, the Israelis will go crazy and they will use their advanced weapons. And that's what we don't want to happen because that will haul in Russia and China into a global thermonuclear contact, conflict. And we'll see, as that movie says, Ohio-class submarines locking on targets in Russia, and Russia within 60 seconds locking on American cities and towns for submarine-launched and land-based missiles. And as I said before, these missiles are not just over the pole. They're in the Guatemalan Mexican uh, jungle. They're in Venezuela. They're in submarines a few hundred miles off either coast, so the strike distance and times are under 20 minutes before cities in America become vaporized clouds well, of the, dust. The, the, the decision process is limited, as you said, to, to less than two minutes. 
<laughs> right. The window, the window of, uh, of of making of saying no, not today. We will not end the world today. Well, and this is why General Makarov, the chairman, the the, the counterpart to General Dempsey, came to Washington not that long ago to meet with General Dempsey, because these military guys have done what most people haven't done. They've gone through the gaming of what happens once the first missile is launched. And yeah. that's what we tried to do with this movie called Unsurvivable, which is available on LaRouchePack.com. We made a movie which shows, based on the best scientific and technical evidence, what happens once those first missiles are launched. And it includes a, a very graphic description of what happened in Hiroshima. And then the point that one Trident missile with multiple warheads has over 400 times the force that that bomb that was used that took out Hiroshima has. And so we're doing this not to just scare people, but to, to show people there is a reality, there are consequences. When you have a president who violates the Constitution, by the way, I want to bring up one other thing. Uh, Congressman Walter Jones, who's another one of the very few courageous people around. He's a Republican from North Carolina. His district includes Camp Lejeune. He was one of the strongest supporters of the Gulf War initially. And then he turned on what President Bush was doing because he said he could no longer justify seeing Americans come home in, in body bags who were sent over there on a false pretense, the weapons of mass destruction. So right. Jones, who's a very strong supporter of the military, sent an open letter to President Obama last week, which is available on the LaRouche Pack website. What Jones said is that according to the Constitution, if Obama were to take offensive military action against Syria without going to the Congress, he would be immediately impeachable. I think there's actually a bill put forward by one of the congressmen now that's actually sitting ready to be passed that if Obama makes any kind of action, either preemptively or in concert with Israel, that he'll be impeached. That's the bill that Walter Jones introduced. It's called yeah. CR 107. Yeah, that, and yeah. lamentably, there are only about eight signers so far, one of whom, interestingly, and I'm glad it happened, is Ron Paul. But what Jones said in this open letter to Obama, which he sent out to every member of the Congress, is if you take this action, you will be committing an impeachable offense. Yeah, and I, I think what we're likely to see, and this is what I have from my other sources, is that Obama is actually seeing that danger of impeachment coming, and I think he is ready to declare martial law. I well, think Obama I think is crazy right. enough it's to so actually dangerous. try to do it, even before the election, if you can create a crisis. It's so dangerous that he gets re-elected that he'll say, see, the people want me to do this. Yeah. Either way, we're in trouble. And Harley, the, um, let's talk about some positive things of what can be done. Um, number one, we need to get Glass-Steagall back in. Number two, we need to get rid of Obama before or after the election. We need to prevent martial law. We need to also prevent a preemptive attack. We do need to stabilize the weapons of mass destruction that both the Islamic countries have and the American, uh, America has in the West, and Israel especially. We need to, you know, I, I think it's wonderful that uh, Dempsey made this statement that we're not going to cover their back, but that's not enough, because Israel is in danger. And if these uh, people we support, which is the, right now America is supporting through Hillary Clinton and Obama, supporting the uh, Muslim Brotherhood and these terrorists, and they get access to RDX and these weapons, they will use them in, against Israel. And if they do, the Israelis are going to go crazy. So we have, it's almost like going down, this would be my analogy, to a, a, an area of Los Angeles. And you have two rival gangs, and the police have advanced notice. And can they see one gang on one end of some boulevard, let's say, and the other gang about two miles away on the other side. And they've got every weapon they can conceivably carry. Uh, razor blades, shotguns, every kind of weapon you can think of. 
and you know they're approaching, you got to stop them before they get to each other, because once they do, all hell is going to break loose. Well, and let's, we, let me, let's, yeah. let's start from the top. The real cause right now, the, the term LaRouche used the other day, is the Anglo-Obama forces. Because this is not in America's interest, what, we're do, what Obama's doing. No, it'll Our, crash the economy and it'll cause uh, yeah. the death and dismemberment of many more Americans. Uh, this will destroy the fabric of society and it'll eventually result in the dissolution of America. So it's not an Anglo-American, it's an Anglo-Obama policy. Now, right. If you can... Now here's the problem. The Americans have made some really bad choices in recent years. No kidding. And uh, the, this is part of the divorce from reality. As long as it looks like the stock market's going up, people don't really care. And then when they start losing, they throw out one set of bums and bring in another set of bums. Like the Republicans who replaced the Democrats in 2010 were no better than the Democrats they replaced. You've had a revolving chair, a Democrat, Republican, Democrat, Republican in the White House, who have done the same policies of Wall Street. So. We have to learn a lesson, which is that the American people have to wake up. We made this movie called Unsurvivable to try to wake people up to recognize that there are horrible consequences that will be paid if we keep Obama in office. That's point number one. Number two, the solution is not Mitt Romney. The solution is to get Obama out and then go with a policy. Now, maybe Romney would, would support a different policy. I don't know. I don't think so. But we've got to fight for a policy, which, as you said, Glass-Steagall, so we stop the bailouts. That's the most important thing about Glass-Steagall, is you stop the bailouts by saying that the U.S. government, the U.S. taxpayers, have no interest in protecting the speculative debt built up by banksters. But we do intend to protect a banking system that can fund a recovery. Now, uh, Ryan, I think, is much more likely, especially with his uh, financial uh, controls coming into, into four over the Romney budget plans, yeah. uh, to actually put in Glass-Steagall. I think that, Romney, that Ryan would be uh, not averse to that. Yeah. And I think that's, that's, that we, we really don't have an alternative arising within the Democratic Party as an alternative to Obama. Let me, let me just give some cheap advice to Mitt Romney. Because he's yeah. spending a lot of money for terrible advice. Yeah, bad advice. advice. You can see that. He's getting advice that's basically this is his election to lose because if Romney and Ryan offer jobs, the sanctity of life issue, and a foreign policy that doesn't bring us to the brink of war, he's in. Well, it's easy. All you'd have yeah. to do, to tell you the truth, would be to say that we've been under a regime of Wall Street and the city of London that's looted our country, that supported the president, and we're going to go with Glass-Steagall to stop the bailouts, and we're going to create credit, which is going to put people back to work building things. He right. was winning landslides. So that's my cheap advice to Mitt Romney. I think now, absolutely. I want to agree 100%. Huh? Um, well, I'll tell you what I suspect was going to happen, is that it won't be Romney so much saying this is Ryan. And I think you're going to start to see that uh, right now it's obvious since Ron Paul said he's not going to run that the conservatives realize that if if we don't have budgetary restraint in terms of uh, you know the crazy printing of money by the federal reserve and uh the speculative banking literally is what they do is they they literally it's like somebody going into your bank account gambling with your money and when they lose they want you to pay the tab well but here's you know here's the problem i i don't want to get into the scenario of romney or ryan versus yeah. obama because we can do that sometime later Right now, what I want to say, which I think will summarize this point, is that Obama is crazy, and Obama is going for immediate confrontation. He's going to continue the economic policies, and he has to be removed. We do have solutions. Now, one, just to take it to the biggest picture, how to deal with these rivalries internationally, one of the things that Mr. LaRouche talked about is the survival of the Earth, that is the use of space technology and, and anti-missile defense systems against uh, asteroids and comets and things like that, that we actually have higher human interests 
Well, not only that, we're looking at the collapse of the magnetosphere. I was looking at a special from Nat Geo. We have lots of other issues that are global, uh, uh, galactic, and, co and cosmic, and, and these are much bigger. The need collaboration with Russian and Chinese and American and British and other scientists and Canadian scientists so we can overcome these. But what we're seeing is well, instead here's of... Here's something you might like, to, yeah. you might find interesting. A couple of my young associates are in the Ukraine right now where they're attending a conference on uh, asteroids, uh, earthquakes, and um, volcanoes, where they're right. talking about this kind of collaborative effort. And I, I think the important thing that, that we can put forward here is that if we use our science and technology in the, the right way, we can get out of the depression we're in and we could have a policy of common effort for peace. And so this is really where our direction has to be. Yeah, in other words, you can preserve the nation state by getting getting Glass Steagall. You can preserve international politics without necessarily uh, accepting Islam. You have to, you would call, de radicalize any political or geopolitical system like uh, the Muslim nations or these terrorists and stop supporting those that are going to make the situation worse. You can stabilize the weapons of mass destruction to both Israel and the Muslim countries have without invasion or causing, uh, you know, uh, closing airspace and then bringing into the conflict Russia and China. All these things are accomplishable. They are, they're all can be accomplished. And I really believe that if we don't accomplish them, the events that we're going to be facing in the solar and galactic and cosmic level will overshadow our little puny attempts to wipe out each other because we disagree on issues. Well, and that's that, exactly the point. And the problem is that you have a president who's destroying our broader defenses, our, our ability to defend against these kinds of galactic problems. Well, I'll give you an and example. One war is a solution. Well, in 1994, I got my security clearance, Q-level clearance, to work as a civilian doctor with U.S. Space Command. And one of the first things I was told is that most of our Space Command weapon systems are aimed out in space to nearest objects. We need collaboration with Russia and China. It requires a giant economy to support this type of structure. And we're only picking up about 3% of the objects that can come into near space and cause major havoc to our satellites, to ground-based communications, and even to monitor things like earthquakes from space, which we have the technology to do that, uh, to monitor things like the disappearance of the magnetosphere. There's 3 million square miles over the South Atlantic that is expanding. And if it's closer to the Earth, it could kill the oceans. It could also spread over uh, Brazil and southern uh, South America. America, uh, and very quickly cause a dead zone. In other words, start to kill everything that's below that radiation area. We need to understand what's going on to the planet. We have to start realizing that we're going through a planetary upheaval. We're going through an area of the galactic plane that has increased the energy as we pass through the northern side of the plane which changes the torsion field and alters the plasma physics of our star and our Earth, which is a nuclear reactor with a crust and a blue line of air around it surrounded by a magnetosphere that's quickly collapsing. And it's, it's, it's collapsing and about to reverse, and it's occurring along with sinkholes, earthquakes. We had a 7.6 now in Costa Rica. There was a, quote, a tsunami warning, which was quickly turned off. But the fact is we are having, since March 11th last year to 2011, a year and a half ago, major increases in earthquakes and now I, I like to have use a new term I call it the uh, and I've, I've seen other people try to take spins off but I call we are now a 2 PF two years post Fukushima and we should learn that an attack on Bashir will make Fukushima look like a party if you hit a fully well, I, I operative reactor time, yeah. let, me, let me just re-emphasize go to the LarouchePack.com website and look at this movie unsurvivable Right. And then give us a call, make a commitment to do something to fight this. Give us a call at 800-922-2907. That's our office in Houston. If you want to talk to me, I've, I've returned calls, 800-922-2907. But make a decision today to do something. Yeah, you have to do something today. Uh, whether it's, it's supporting uh, politicians, both Democrat and Republican or Independent, that are going to do the right thing. They're going to get blast steagall and deal with these financial and other issues. Uh, and uh, a true world where you can have peace through strength, not through uh, willy-nilly kind of childish acts of violence that will cause an out of control situation. Because we can obviously tell that Obama has never served in the military and never had to... Uh, deal with the fact of a relative dying from a violent death or dismembered because of a 
sent to a war where there, should have, where there were no weapons of mass destruction. He's, he's never had to deal with that. General Dempsey has sent men to die, and he understands the difference. So 800-922-2907. Amazing. Uh, our Health and Wellness Hour coming up in Hour 3. Let's see preparedness.